whether gathered together or spread across our city or the world. We are the church. We're so glad you've joined us today, SBC. Get God, get real, and get out there. Hey, welcome. Welcome to Scottsdale Bible Church Cactus Campus. Woo, this is exciting for me. Normally, I get, or you, you get me in little four-minute increments, and so the good news about 9 o'clock is it has to be over by 11, and so <laughs> I'm a little anxious, a little worried, because uh, a lot's been going through my head over the last few weeks as I prepared for this message. I'm looking for my wife, too. Is she here? Did she? Oh, there she is. There she is. I haven't seen my wife for a long time, and so I've just... I don't know. <laughs> Uh, that usually means it was a harder morning getting out of the house this morning, and so um, um, <laughs> that just totally distracted me. Real, real quick, but before I get into too much of what I want to share, uh, Brooke gave me this right before I went up. You know, I had a few things in my head, but she said, could you do this? And so um, for, for you ladies that are new to Phoenix that have just moved here, there's an incredible ministry that we're going to host here called After the Boxes Are Unpacked, and it's going to be on Wednesday mornings here at the church, and so it's a great way, if you're relatively new here, you're looking to find friends, meet people, kind of find out why in the world did God move me to this God-forsaken desert, um, that would be an opportunity for you to go. And so there's some of these in the lobby, or go see Brooke, um, you're laughing, I could tell you moved to this God-forsaken desert. So so this is Vision, uh, a Vision Sunday, and, and what's great for me being able to share Vision is as I was unpacking this with kind of the, the, the communications team at the church, they said, you know, what's your vision? You know, is it going to be about some new ministries and uh, new things? And I said, you know, our vision is not going to be about new buildings or new ministries or new super serving opportunities, although those things are really important, and obviously we've been blessed pretty richly here with a new building. Um, but it's never, for me, been about the building. It's always been about the people. And, and not only the people in our community, but the people outside of this community. And really, my vision for us, it's a really simple message. And I'll give you the, what I'm trying to express to you right up front. And so you can leave in the next five minutes, and you'll be done. But you'll know what my vision is. Um, but truly, my vision for you is that we would become a people that look more like Jesus. And not just be content to rest in this idea that we have salvation, we got our ticket to heaven, and we're good, and we don't have to worry about it or redeem it until sometime later. And so really my vision for us, and, and the passage that we're going to look from is, look at is from the book of Colossians. And that was a letter that was written to a church. I think it's very applicable that we would be speaking this letter to a church. It wasn't meant for those outside the church. It was meant for those of us who call uh, our Lord Jesus, our Savior, our Lord and Savior. And so I think it was appropriate that um, that message would be flowing through us today. So um, I want to read for you just an opening passage to kind of give you this charge that Paul has for us. And then I'm going to pray and then kind of share some stories with you along the way. And so we're going to look at a, a unique version, which I, it's called The Message. It's written by Eugene Peterson. It, it's not a direct translation of the scriptures, so it's not one that I, I go and do my deep studies in. It's just one that sometimes illuminates the word in such a way that it's a little bit more conversational, a little bit more readable. And so listen to what... Um, Eugene Peterson has done as far as Colossians chapter 2 with the words of Paul. So he says, my counsel for you is simple and straightforward. Just go ahead with what you've been given. You receive Christ Jesus, the master. Now live him. You're deeply rooted in him. You're well constructed upon him. You know your way around the faith. Now do what you've been taught. School's out. Quit studying the subject and start living it. And let your living spill over into thanksgiving. Watch out now for the people who try to dazzle you with big words and intellectual double talk. They want to drag you off into endless arguments that never amount to anything. They spread their ideas through the empty traditions of human beings and the empty superstitions of spirit beings. But that's not the way of Christ. Everything of God gets expressed in Him so you can see and hear Him clearly. 
You don't need a telescope, a microscope, or a horoscope to realize the fullness of Christ and the emptiness of the universe without him. When you come to him, that fullness comes together for you too. His power extends over everything. Entering into this fullness is not something you figure out or achieve. It's not a matter of being circumcised or keeping a long list of laws. No, you're already in, insiders. Not through some secret initiation right, but rather through what Christ has already gone through for you, destroying the power of sin. If it's an initiation ritual you're after, you've already been through that by submitting to baptism. Going under the waters was a burial of your old life, and coming up out of it was resurrection. God raising you from the dead as he did in Christ. When you were stuck in your old sin-dead life, you were incapable of responding to God. God brought you alive, right along with Christ. Think of it. All sins forgiven, the slate wiped clean, that old arrest warrant canceled and nailed to Christ's cross. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority at the cross and marched them naked through the streets. Heavenly Father, man, those are some inspiring words for us. We come before you, Lord and Savior, maker of heaven and earth. And Lord, I come before you acknowledging I am a sinner and I need your strength today. Lord, may you increase, may I decrease, may these words be your words today. Almighty God and more merciful Father, we humbly submit ourselves and fall down before your majesty, asking you from the bottom of our hearts that this seed of your word now sown among us may take such deep root that neither the burning heat of persecution cause it to wither, nor the thorny cares of this life choke it, but that as seed sown in good ground, it may bring forth 30, 60, or 100-fold, as your heavenly wisdom has appointed. Amen. Well, the year was 1986. Two important people came into my life in 1986. Some of you weren't even born in 1986, but that was when two people came into my life. One was Jesus. It was the first time I really had heard the gospel. I'm sure it was shared with me hundreds of times before, but my heart was never opened to receive it. And it was on that particular chapel service at a Christian college of which I was not a Christian that I heard that message oh so clear, that I was a sinner, that everything I was trying to fill my life with at that point was going to leave me empty, hurting, and maybe destroying things, and there was only one hope, and that hope was Jesus. And he was a good, good father. My father had left our home when I was about 12 years old, and so I didn't really have a good role model of what a father was like. The Lord was gracious to put several men in my life that I could look up to and say, that's a glimpse of a father, a good father. But ultimately, at that moment, I realized that this was a good heavenly father who only had good things planned for me. And so in the quietness of my heart, in the middle of that gymnasium, I raised my hands and said, I receive you. I didn't know a lot of scripture. In fact, I couldn't even quote, I couldn't find books in the Bible. I was just a, an immature little kid, but I knew Jesus was the answer. It would be at a cafeteria a few days later that I would spot a slender, tall, athletic woman walking through the, the line, <laughs> getting her food. And, and she hates when I tell this story, but she, she, she's a trained athlete. I, I was a baseball player, and so we're a little less trained athletes. Um, <laughs> She was running upwards of 60 to 80 miles a week as a collegiate cross-country runner. I was content to do 90-foot sprints, followed by several minutes of rest. Um, and so for me, eating was more fun. Her eating was more of a necessity. And so she went through the line with this tray that was heaped with food. And I was just blown away by it. But more than the food, I was captured by this woman. And... Men are very shallow people. I fully admit that. We spot someone who's really pretty, and we go, that's going to be the girl for me. And sure enough, that's what I set my heart and mind towards. And, and, and what happened immediately at that point is I began to change myself, you know, change my routes around college. So, oh, I just happened to run into you. And so <laughs> change where I 
Change where I sat at the basketball game so that I would just leave one seat open, you know, in this full, oh, here, there's a seat right here. Um, I would just change everything so that I changed classes. I changed my personal grooming habits just so that I could be in her presence. Um, and so <laughs> one particular day, I finally, I, my problem was I couldn't speak to her. That, I know you find that really weird, but I could not talk to her. And so uh, finally, I muscled up enough energy to say, hey, could we hang out for a little bit? I'd like to get to know you better. And she said, well, my schedule is such that I only have uh, the afternoon of Sundays available. And it kind of worked into my schedule because we were busy throughout the week. But it was Sunday afternoon. She said, I have to go on a recreational run. And in my mind, I didn't have quite a compartment for what a recreational run would look like. Of course, I'm accustomed to 90-foot sprints, followed by several minutes of rest. And so, but being that this was the person I really believed I was meant to be with the rest of my life, I said, sure, I'll do a recreational run. What exactly does a recreational run look like? And she said, well, it's kind of at my own pace, but it's anywhere from an hour to two hours of running. And I said, okay. <laughs> So, so again, I, I muscled up the energy. I met her. I didn't even know how to stretch. I didn't know really what to wear. The shoes I had were not really great running shoes, but I wanted to be with this woman. And so I was going to do whatever means necessary so that I could be with her. And so we took off running, and fortunately, as you leave the campus, it's downhill. So I hadn't lost all of my breath by the time we got to the bottom of the hill. And so being the trained athlete, athlete that Jill was, she was able to talk and converse over this next hour or two. I was doing everything I could to just let air continue moving through my lungs. Um, but the other thing that sometimes we're known for as men is we don't, we're, we got egos and so we won't let, you know, little failures like that happen. And so we just continued to run and she continued to talk and I just wanted to be with her, but I also knew there was a chance I could die. <laughs> And either way, it was going to be okay, because I now knew Jesus, and so my, my eternal security was set, but, but I kind of wanted to be with this person. And so um, I, I hatched a plan as, uh, as I could, as a little bit of blood that was still flowing to my head, I could think. I remembered that we were on our way back to the campus. We had turned, and we started to come back. And now, as you go down the hill from the campus, the return way is up the hill to the campus. And I had barely enough gas in the tank to even make it. To that hill. And, and so I hatched a plan that as you started up the hill, there was a little forest below the campus, and I could duck into the forest, collapse out of sight from Jill, and pretend like I finished the race. And so it took every bit of energy I had to muscle up words, because up until that point, pretty much all my words were just nods, grunts, and groans. And so I said, it's been great being with you. I'm just going to duck off into the forest and run back to my dorm, and I'll see you later. And I didn't ask. I didn't look for a response. I just darted off into the trees. And when I felt like I was out of sight, I just collapsed. And I went, oh, my stars. I could die at this moment in the forest. No one's going to find me here. But what was fascinating about that story is there's two realities that come out of that story. One is Jesus is real. And if Jesus is your first love, will you change everything that you have to be with them? Will you do things that you normally don't do? Will you run a race that you have never run? And I think this passage in Colossians that we're going to look at this morning emphasizes kind of what we all fall into, is that we receive this Jesus as our first love, and there's a moment in time where it's just real, that we want to be with him every moment that we can be. But then time comes on, because in 1986, the next year became 1987, the next year became 1988, and time starts to come on you, laundry starts to stack up, you get a mortgage, you get kids, you kind of introduce some new idols into your life as you begin working towards stuff. Maybe those little sins become a little bit bigger sins that you've attempted to control that maybe get a little bit out of hand. Um, you begin to set your heart and mind on things that aren't on Jesus. And this Christian journey, friend, is, is not one when you raise your hand in chapel, you're not immediately taken up to the mothership at that point. 
you now have to live a life that is indicative of who you love. And the problem we have, the problem that was then, the problem is now, is what we're presenting to the world is something or something else that we love that's not Jesus. And so this message to the Colossians is really about becoming mature in Christ. He's speaking to a church that um, he's really clear. He says, we thank you for your faith. We're grateful for your faith. We pray for you. But, and and it's never good when an apostle says but. And he says, but I I just, I, I see some things in your life that reflect that you love something else. And those things are coming forth in your life. And, and here's my, my desire for you, is that you don't forsake your first love. And friends, 90-foot sprints are not going to prepare you for that long race. You're going to have to do some hard work. It requires something on your behalf. And so Paul would say in, first, or in Colossians chapter 1, and I'm going to use my glasses because sometimes I come up with about four different versions if I go without them, but... Um, He says this, I want you to remember this, Colossians. It's in him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. And that's my desire for us. When when I was getting hired, uh, Pastor Jamie gave me kind of his expectations, and I keep them on a little card right in front of my desk because it's always good when your boss tells you what's expected of you and you follow him. And one of the things was, he said, well, I asked him, I said, this congregation that's going to become Cactus, are, are, are they, do you want me just to be the manager of this place? You know, turn on the lights, turn off the lights, make sure the coffee's made, and, and make sure that there's a safe place for them to meet. He said, no, I want these to be your flock. I want this to be your congregation. And, and here's my charge to you is I want you to build them up in maturity, I want you to equip them so that they can do the work of the kingdom. This isn't just simply something I want you to oversee in a management type of role. I want you to truly be a shepherd. And so as I was kind of crafting this message, the only thing that came to mind was it's not about buildings, it's not about ministries, it's not about creating new serving opportunities, it's about you, it's about me. Building us up in maturity. Because there's this crazy thing that happens, and I don't know why it happens, but we accept Jesus. Maybe it's just on our American culture. It's like, I'm good now, and I can continue to live a life that I want to live or a life that's morally acceptable, but it has no root and no basis in Christ. And so Paul spends a significant amount of time pointing them back to the true source of their love, their faith. Look at one of the dangers of this idea of Christianity when we walk into it. It's written by C.I. Schofield, which is an early uh, theologian from the 1800s. He says, pure Christianity lives between two dangers ever present. The danger that it will evaporate into a philosophy and the danger that it will freeze into form. You know, the danger that it will evolve into a philosophy is it just becomes another one of those truths that people place on their lives. It it, it just goes right into any of the other philosophies that are out there of life, Darwinism, evolution, um, reincarnation, whatever it is, that Christianity would just drift into just becoming a philosophy. That's one of the dangers. And then the other dangers is where I think we fall into is where it just becomes stagnant. It becomes something that doesn't grow. It just becomes something that I raised my hand back in college in 1986 and never really fully evolves past that point. Because back in our mind, we've got that ticket that we got to heaven, and what we did was we took it to our office, we put it in a drawer, and then we walked away from it, just knowing that I'm going to redeem that ticket at some point in time in the future. But God is so good to us. If you truly know him and he truly loves you, he will provide you with opportunities to draw near to him. And whether it's time, laundry, mortgages, kids, circumstances, the phone call comes in that says there's a spot that we need to look at. Maybe that sin that you were able to keep under control has now gotten out of hand and it has the potential to wreck your entire life and you find yourself going back to that drawer and pulling out that ticket and going, but I've got this ticket to eternity. And God's saying, 
I want you to enjoy me now. I don't want you to wait to enjoy me in the future. Listen to what Piper would say in one of his books with regards to enjoying God now. He says, test your heart. Why do you want forgiveness? Why do you want to be justified? Why do you want the wrath of God to be propitiated? Why do you want eternal life? Is the decisive answer because I want to enjoy God now and forever? We tend to put our salvation as something that we wait for. But friends, for those of us who know the Lord, we are living that salvation now. And God wants you to enjoy him now. And so as we turn to the book of Colossians, there's really a theme that comes through in the passage. And I'm kind of doing a great flyover of Colossians. That's the problem when you only preach every once in a while. You take 400 passages of scripture and try and pack them into about 30 minutes. And so I apologize up front. But this is really a theme about pursuing your first love. That will you change everything that you have to be with that first love? And, and, and the way I like to describe with people, there's another note that I keep above my desk. Is, it says, if you feast on Jesus, you won't want to feast on anything else. And the problem we have, just as the problem they had back in the early church, was they began to wander. They began to drift. They stopped pursuing their first love, and they began pursuing another love, other things. And so as we turn to Colossians, what Paul does oh so swiftly and oh so gently is he reminds them of their first love. And so he would say this in Colossians chapter 2. I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 1. He would remind them of this. He would say, God is this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. What I find amazing about that passage is, and it's really an example I, I can give you, is I do a lot of marriage counseling. And, and, and when I do marriage counseling, it's not full-on marriage counseling because I come up front, I'm not a marriage counselor. But I'm kind of the triage, the emergency room when perhaps after 15, 20 years, something has occurred, and sometimes that sin has gotten out of hand. Sometimes their loves have been divided. And so they come in, and they begin talking to me. And I hear their story, and so I try to listen up front because I'm really trying to grasp where they're coming from. And so the, the wife will speak, the husband will speak, and, and it's funny, their posture is such that they're not even looking at each other, and it's just generally about the other person and, and it comes out I just I don't even I don't even think I know this person it's not the person I married and and there's all this separation that has occurred before them and so I just listen I go huh fascinating I said can you tell me about the moment you guys first met the first moment that you knew that was the person for you and immediately silence fills that space and they begin to tell a story much like my story of nearly dying running for a couple hours. Because I tell them, I said, there was a point in time in your life when your undying love, that you changed everything that you wanted, needed, had, so that you could be with that person for all of eternity. And yet you spent some time over the last 15, 20 years not pursuing that and you allowed time and laundry and mortgages and kids and all these things to stack up so that it began separating you from your first love. And so I would imagine Paul has heard some things from the Colossians saying, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. And he says, let me go back to your first love. And more than just any love, he is our God. He is creator. He is the one who died for you. What I find so amazing about this church is that this is only about 30 years after the resurrection. And so there were several people probably in this midst who are reading this letter that either saw Jesus rise from the dead or firsthand knowledge that he rose from the dead. 
And yet, in just 30 years' time, they began to drift a little bit. Listen to what Paul says in Colossians chapter 2. He says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up and established in faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. And verse 8 says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the word, and not according to Christ. They have become deceived by the world. They have begun to taste and see that things of the world are good as opposed to seeing and tasting things of the Lord is good. And so over time, they began to drift. And what I love what Paul does, he just says, I'm not going to talk about any of that stuff. I just want to go back to your first love. I want you to repeat the story of when he became your first love. And just so you know, he is God. He is the creator of the universe. He's the creator of you. And here's what's amazing is he died for you so that you could have life. And so that's the God that Paul points them back to lovingly. This isn't an odd occurrence in the early church, and I don't think it's an odd occurrence in us. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians to that church. He says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. John would record these words of Jesus in Revelation to the church in Ephesus. But this I have against you is that you've abandoned the love you had at first. This is not a a strange occurrence. It's not a strange occurrence within us. I love meeting with people when they have these crises of faith and they went back to their drawer and they pulled that ticket to heaven out and they said, yeah, but I've got this ticket to heaven. And I said, well, what have you done in the meantime to enjoy heaven now? And typically the conversation goes into things that are of the world and not the things of Jesus. What's really scary is when they go to that drawer and realize they really never had a ticket to heaven. And their crisis of faith reveals that they really did not know who this Jesus was. And so the problem then is the same problem now. We are astonished or we are deceived by shiny things, those things of the world that take us away from our first love. Wanting to change everything that we have so that we could be with that first love. Do things that are absolutely crazy so that we could be with that first love. And it is a journey. It is a journey. You know, um, Paul says this near the end of his life, and I by no means equate myself with Paul. But he says this in 1 Timothy, and this is kind of as he's nearing the end of his days. He says, the saying is trustworthy and deserving and of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners, of which I am the foremost. Now, this is Paul. After planning all these churches, the missionary journeys, the countless Christians that have come to the faith, he recognized that he is still the foremost of all the sinners. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, the honor and glory and forever. Amen. Even Paul, at the end of his life, reflects back to just how big God is and just how little he is. How much he needs him and ultimately how much he loves him. And he knows he gets to enjoy God now and forever. Paul would go to say, I know there's this eternal weight of glory that's awaiting me. But Paul had work to do. This early church, there was no advantage in this time to becoming a Christian. The Christians at that time were the small movement of people that were up against the largest superpower of the, of the time who were looking to squash them, to squash their movement. And yet these early Christians, who there was no advantage to raising their hand in chapel to become one, would change the world of which we are the benefactors of today. They would stand face-to-face with persecution, face-to-face with losing everything that they had because they knew Jesus was real, and they knew without a doubt that he was their first love. And they did everything they could because they had everything stripped away 
to pursue him. And yet, just in a few years, they would begin to pursue other things. And so Paul is extra, uh, he, he puts added emphasis on this idea of, I want you to remember who your first love is. The second thought that's coming out of this, uh, uh, cha- or this book of Colossians is, if this Jesus is real, he is going to complete this work, making you mature. You don't have to really worry about it. But he goes back to if this Jesus is real. And he says, I don't want to have to remind you what maturity looks like. And he has this beautiful passage. It's a little bit long, so, so allow me to give me a little bit of a grace in reading it for you. He says, I want you to put to death certain things and put on certain things. Because the, the church in Colossians, Colossae, Colossae, as well as I think the church here, you know, we, we, we allow these other philosophies to drift in and we begin to kind of become confused on who Jesus is, but we also allow some of the practices to drift into our lives so that we look less like him. And so listen to what Paul says in chapter 3 of Colossians. He says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, and you will also appear in glory. So I want you to put these things to death. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil, desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk with your mouth. Do not lie, with one, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of the creator. So put on then as God's chosen holy ones. Chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against one another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so above, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful." Too often the church is one to point to the outside and say, look how immoral they're living and they're not looking towards themselves. And so Paul provides kind of a laundry list of things that we want to investigate and see, is there any of those things going on within our life? And he says, you need to put those to death. But the great encouragement with regards to the first point, which is pursuing Christ, is if you're truly pursuing him, those things become very evident And they become very uh, concerning to you. And your desire to put them to death becomes very active. And so the first point will take care of the second point. Pursuing God will take care of the putting to death side. Coming back to what I talked about, feasting on Jesus. Too often we keep Jesus as someone who's convenient but not necessarily close to us. You know, our days get busy, like I said, with laundry and mortgages and kids and sicknesses and idols and sin, and we don't keep Jesus close to us. We're not consuming him as much as we ought. I am convicted every single Sunday of that as I stand before you, and for a variety of reasons that I just don't think I should be standing before you if I'm not in such a way in which I'm walking fervently with the Lord. But the second thing that happens is at 9.05 every Sunday morning, and it's without fail, and it's amazing, and it's got to be the Holy Spirit. Our phones are these just nasty blessings and curses that have been given to us from great minds, but also, I think, of the devil. (laughs) There is so much information that's coming out of those phones. Statistics say we touch them uh, nearly 2,000 times a day, and... If you add that, if, if you add notifications to that, it's even more than that. And so what I did purposely was I turned off most of my notifications. So I just get a text message, I get a phone call, 
We have a little family chat that, that, that I get notified of. Uh, but I don't get news. I don't get sports. I don't get breaking weather updates. Even if a haboob is coming into Phoenix, I wouldn't know it because um, so, I just don't want to be distracted by it. But it's funny, at 9.05 on Sunday morning, I did not set this up. I did not set the time. I did not set anything up. But I'm down here worshiping with you all, and I get this bling note. And I look at it, and it's my screen time use notification. And it convicts me every single Sunday because it tells me where I've spent my time with my phone over that last seven days. And sometimes it's been a really good week. And sometimes the Lord's saying to me, wow, I can see football season has just kicked off. <laughs> and so I'm just as easily distracted from my first love as you are. And so when I prepare a message for you, it is just not only for you, but it is also for me. You know, because we are either growing in our love for the Lord or we're growing in our love for the world. I put together this chart that just, I probably stole it from somebody, but it was in my head and it came out. So if you've seen a chart like this um, and it's accredited to somebody, accredited to them, but I don't remember, it was just in my head because I share this illustration a lot from us. So along this line, we have kind of our lifeline and we have birth, we have death, and then we have eternity. And the line, first line that runs uh, vertical is growing in likeness of the world, and the second half is growing in likeness of Christ. And there's this little moment in time where God begins to do a work in our lives. And, and sometimes you don't know when that happens, but it's this little split to where I begin, before I know him, growing in my love for him. And I don't even know that's happening. And so it's still below this line but it begins to track upwards. And then there's this moment. There's this moment that Jesus becomes real and he becomes truly your first love. And at that moment, it's wonderful because the Holy Spirit now indwells you and you begin to move in a direction that grows in your likeness of him. You begin to go, hey, these old sins I don't really like. I actually like some of those songs now. I actually enjoy reading scripture. I want to begin feasting on Jesus. And then as time and laundry and mortgages and sicknesses and stuff occur, you know, the, the line kind of dips a little bit. If you don't know Jesus, you just continue to grow in the world. And what's so sad about what I'm seeing right now is there's a despondency now that has crept into our world that, you know, people would just go through life just continuing to grow in their idea that the world has everything to offer, and they just end up dying naturally as a result of that. Um, but now there's a despondency that's occurring somewhere between what would be a normal death and what I would call an abnormal death, is that the suicide rate, especially among young guys, is just off the charts because the world has nothing to offer them. And so... What I want to encourage us is that God's at work if you know him, and he's working in you. And you will continue to grow in your knowledge, your likeness to him, and it's okay there's going to be seasons in which you recognize I'm a sinner more foremost than anyone else. But in the end, the trend is your friend. And so as you see a line, it might look squiggly, but the trend ought to look like you're growing more in the knowledge and glory of God. I can see I'm quickly running out of time. But what I want to do is, is I want to share with you another story. The, the world would tell you, and the reason why we're so attracted to these other things is because they taste good for a while. You know, whether it be our jobs, money, um, drugs, alcohol, uh, fill in the blank. Anything that's not of Jesus, they taste good for a while. But they ultimately leave you hungry. They ultimately leave you thirsty. Um, they ultimately make you want more. And you realize those things just can't provide it. My danger is potato chips. I come home from Sunday. I'm famished. The first thing I do is grab potato chips. And I just start eating them. I feel terrible afterwards. They really don't fill me up. But I realize I just stuck this in my mouth, and it's not very good. Well, I mentioned a lot of bad things that, that we do that we like to taste. But there's also a lot of good things that we taste that that aren't necessarily moving us in the direction of growing in our likeness of the Lord. 
And there was about a two-week stretch this summer where uh, we were able to get away a little bit. And we went up to a house up in Washington State that required a lot of work, uh, a lot of landscaping, a lot of trimming, a lot of um, lawn mowing. And so I was very busy doing that. It was also all our kids came into town, which we don't get to see our kids a whole lot. And two of them brought their, their kids, which... You know, those are, those are called grandkids, and, we, and we're all excited about having grandkids now, and so we got to spend some time with them, and, and I got to be known as Pappy, and it was just this really sweet time that we had together, and I find myself out mowing the grass, and I have my headphones on, and I'm listening to music, and, and just not even thinking about it, just how much of a good time I'm having for a couple weeks. Well, then I get a phone call from, or we get a phone call from a, a sweet gal. Um, it, it's a gal who's the daughter of one of my wife's best friends. And she died at a young age uh, in her 30s of cancer, um, but she had this little baby. And this little baby has had kind of a challenging life growing up and had um, grew up without a mom and a dad. A, a dad came in at the end of the life, but it's just a challenging little time. And um, we've been in her life a lot because we kind of felt this just bond to, to this young gal as a result of the friendship that Jill had with her mom. And what was amazing is we get a phone call from her one day, and she says, hey, I'm getting baptized this weekend. And it was just the most amazing thing because we just think only God could have redeemed and redeemed this tough life that this girl had had. And so it, we got to see her a lot and her kids because she ended up having a couple kids. And um, hard life, I don't need to get into all the details, but it's a hard life, but just a joyful uh, young gal. And so she calls us up and she says, hey, would you want to come to my church on Tuesday night? They're having a, a prayer and worship night. It's called Pursuit. And we said, sure, because we're church people, right? Um, now, for two weeks, I've just kind of taken a break from my walk with the Lord. Now, just so you don't think I'm a complete heathen, we would pray before we ate. Um, but for two weeks, I pretty much was feasting on my kids, my landscaping, my grandkids, um, whatever music I wanted to listen to. And, and I ended up saying, yes, we're going to go to this pursuit night. Well, I ended up going to this pursuit night, and it was a church that was a little more charismatic than ours. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. We walked in, the music was going, hands were up, everybody's talking, and I found myself immediately getting washed over with the living water. I didn't realize I had become dehydrated even after two weeks of just drifting from the Lord. I began, I'm normally a one-hand raiser. <laughs> I'm here to tell you the second hand went up. I began praying out loud as they began to ask us to pray out loud. I actually, I'm almost embarrassed to say this, I don't fall to my knees very often. I fell to my knees and began praying in that room. I began to be filled with the Lord. I, I didn't realize in just two weeks of not pursuing my first love that I was starting to become dehydrated. My wife, the great cost country runner, when I say I'm thirsty, she says, you're dehydrated. And I said, I'm just thirsty. She says, no, you're dehydrated. And I said, no, I'm just thirsty. And she says, no, 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 you don't even know it. You're dehydrated. And so I began drinking water. And so I didn't even know it over those two weeks. But when I walked into that room, I was completely filled with Jesus. I was completely reminded that he's my first love. I was completely reminded that he is all I want. He is all I need. He's sufficient for all things. And even two weeks of taking a break from good things, not even bad things, I became thirsty for Jesus. And so I guess that's my encouragement for us today. You know, Jill, it would take her many months to succumb to my animal magnetism. <laughs> She did not quite have the same affection for me as I had for her. Partly it was because I didn't know how to speak in front of her. Um, but here's the good news with Jesus. He wants you. John Tyson, this, this great pastor out of New York, Church of, New, Church of the City, says this, God goes where he's wanted. And every morning, this is what I want to encourage you with. There's a chair in your home that Jesus is sitting in. And he's saying, Robert, come and sit with me for a, a minute. 
Hey, Robert, could, could, could you come and just talk to me for a second? Hey, um, I just got some things I'd like to talk to you about. Hey, I know there's some things on your mind that, that you want to talk about. In fact, I know there's some things that are going to happen in about six months from now that will be really sweet if you're walking with me now. It will make it a little bit easier to go through. That Jesus is sitting in your room right now just beckoning you to come to him. And yet that is the simple message of this book of Colossians. And I'm sorry that I've overwhelmed you with a significant amount of verses. I would encourage you to go and read the book of Colossians for yourself. You know, God's not looking for us to just enjoy him in eternity. He's looking for us to enjoy him now. But we must pursue him now. And what I want to do is make an announcement of something that I want to do with you is at this point in time in a message, people are looking for, okay, what do you want me to do? How do I do this? How do I pursue Jesus? And, and a lot of times we say, you need to join a small group, you need to join this class, you need to do this, you need to serve more, you need... And, and, and I'm going to try and encourage us that I think we should be doing less and not more. And, and there was an ancient practice that was done a long time ago by the early church fathers, and it was called practicing spiritual disciplines spiritual practices, following the way, or there's a great ministry which I'm going to launch here that's a ministry that's already involved that John Mark Comer is a part of called Practicing the Way. And what it is, it's a way in which we can walk in the footsteps of Jesus, that we can draw close to him. There are these ancient practices that go from Sabbath to fasting to scripture to worship to prayer to gratitude to generosity, these practices in which the ancient church fathers would participate in, not for the goal of just checking off that they had spent some time with Jesus, but they literally got close to Jesus, and they began to become transformed from the inside out. As I read in that opening passage, you don't need a whole lot more information if you're a Christian. You just simply need to do it, and you simply need to do it by pursuing Jesus so that he can do it through you. And so beginning in October, I don't know if I have a slide for that up here, but there's a, I don't have a slide for that up here, so. Um, Beginning in October, and I want to say it's the 13th, on Thursday nights for the four weeks, I'm going to help lead and facilitate a study and just a, a discussion on Sabbath. Because as the early church, as I said, there was no advantage to them to becoming Christians at the time. But God was sent this message to them because he knew you have to endure. The world is, is, is needing you to endure. And it's the same message for us today. But in our message, we don't have to worry as much about persecution. We've just got so much busyness in our lives. I don't have to be reminded at 9.05 that there are plenty of times I am giving to the world and not to Jesus. And so what we're going to do is take four weeks for just an hour on Thursday nights and walk through this this spiritual discipline of Sabbath to where we begin truly getting close to Jesus, pursuing Jesus. Because he wants you, and he wants to use you in a significant way. And based on Nate being behind me, we are running out of time (laughs) <laughs> I, I've got I'm sorry I've got so much in my head for this but I guess to close imagine what it would look like we, we have about 850 adults that call this place home we have about 150 plus kids the Amblers just had a new baby this week and so we just added we have 151 kids that call this place home Um, We have 125 youth that are on fire on Sunday nights that call this place home. A little more than 1,000 people that call this place home. Can you imagine what it would look like if all of us were pursuing Christ with everything that we had because he is truly our first love? We're forsaking all others. We're changing all of our habits, our routines, so that we could be with that Jesus. Can you imagine what that would look like in your home, at your school, in this community, that we would look nothing like the world, 
that we had put to death all these things that allowed us to look like the world and we put on truly a Christ-likeness. Because what Paul would toil for then, it's what your pastor is toiling for now, is that we would all look like Christ, that we would move and grow in maturity and we would not look like ourselves. That all those things that we used to do, we don't do anymore. So that when people looked at us, they would see Christ. And I want to encourage you. We're all here to do it together. We're all on different paths on this journey. We're all at different paces. Some of you 90-foot sprints are all you can do at this point, and that's okay. But you can't stay doing 90-foot sprints if you're going to run a marathon. I can promise you that. And this race that Christ has us on from birth to death and hopefully to life is one that's going to require some work on your part. He doesn't want you to just redeem this ticket at the end of your life or when things get tough. He wants you to redeem this ticket every day. He wants you to tell yourself the gospel every single day that you've been redeemed, that you've been reconciled, that you have a purpose. I can just imagine what that would look like as a vision for this place, that people become more and more like Christ. So I hope you will join me on that. Look for more information on practicing the way. It'll be coming out to you guys in the next few weeks. And so let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I hope you've made sense for these people of what's in my head. Lord, this has been on my heart for several weeks as I've navigated really a simple message that we would not forsake our first love. Lord, that we would draw near to you, and as your word said, you will draw near to us, that we would come to you heavy laden and burdened, and you will give us rest, but we must come to you. And so, Lord, stir in our hearts a thirst, a hunger for you, that we would desire to feast on you and nothing else. Lord, that you would fill us up with your power, your glory, and Lord, that we would be shining lights that would blind this community pointing them to you. So Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for this message. Thank you for your words that ring true today as they did 2,000 years ago. May we be people who love you with everything that we have. It's in the precious name of Jesus I pray.